All right, well, I'll, I'll get started. Uh, thank you um, for inviting me here. It's an honor to be here. And um, I'm going to go over my slides now. You guys just heard about the excellent talk on colorectal cancer, and I'm going to go through um, um, some of the trials that were highlighted at ASCO uh, 2019, just earlier this month. And so um, I'm, the format is going to be a little different. I'm going to have a ton of slides on the on, on, on these trials, but uh, I promise I'll make the conclusion very obvious, and so it, it will be simple to understand. Um, so just kind of go through these are my disclosure uh, for clinical trial support and advisory boards. Um, so again, we're going to go over a, a few trials in pancreatic cancer, and I suspect these um, will allow us to think about how we practice, maybe practice changing, but, but we'll, we'll go over that. I think it's debatable. Um, but, and so it's, we're going to talk about the APAC trial, which is um, com comparing gemcitabine and that palipaxel with gemcitabine in the adjuvant setting for pancreatic cancer. Uh, and we'll I'll talk a little bit about the POLO trial, um, which was, was featured in the plenary session at ASCO um, uh, this year. Um, it's going to affect, you'll, you'll see it will affect a very small percentage of patients, um, but it's, it's important because it's the first biomarker-driven trial in pancreatic cancer. And then we'll talk a little bit about the new standard in second-line chemotherapy in bile duct cancer. Um, that's uh, the ABC06 uh, trial. And, and finally, well, if we get, get through those trials, um, I promise we will, we'll talk a little bit about the debates in, in terms of uh, advanced GE junction cancer. Um, so right now, there's a, often a dilemma in tumor board. I don't know how um, much of GE junction cancers you guys see usually, but um, often it's kind of chemo radiation based on the CROSS trial or uh, perioptic chemotherapy using either, in the past, the MAGIC trial, um, EOX, e ECF type of regimen, or now the FLOT. So um, um, there's been ongoing debate about which one is better and which one to use. So we'll go over some of that uh, debate. So, um, so starting out with a question. Um, so 70-year-old, otherwise healthy um, um, female with T3N1 pancreatic head cancer, so stage 2B, had a Whipple resection about eight weeks ago, uh, excellent performance status, no comorbidities, um, and really no, no evidence of metastatic disease anywhere. So now, as a standard, adjuvant therapy should be considered, and, and these are kind of the options. I don't know if you can read this, but I'll, I'll read it out. A, um, Fulfirinox for six months, um, based on the new, um, the, the recent Protege uh, 24 trial. Um, GEMCAP, or gemcitabine capsidabine for six months based on the ISPAC-4 trial, um, or gemcitabine and nap palitaxel for six months, um, and then, or another, the next option for single-agent gemcitabine. This is a Congo one um, based on long time, the data from a long time ago, or are we still doing chemo radiation? Um, there is an audience response. Yeah, so. Is there an interactive thing? Okay. So, um, so that's interesting. Um, so no, no one, um, well, okay, well, the number's shifting. Looks like most of you would use gem, gemcitabine and, and napalitaxel, um, or now it's even. It's just, so half and half, okay. But it's interesting that no one um, is picking option B, or gemcitabine capsidine based, based on aspect four. Um, and we can review that in a little bit. Okay, so, well, still shifting. <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll move on. Um, but, but uh, it sounds like most of you would use combination therapy. Uh, so here, I don't know my slides are pointing out. Here, okay, well, I'll look at this. So um, as you, most of you uh, should already know, pancreatic cancer is probably one of the deadliest, can de deadliest cancer uh, around you know, with a five-year survival rate of less than 10%. Um, oops, sorry, let me go back here. And this, like, five-year survival rate about 8%. Um, and really, st still the survival is abysmal. Um, okay. Yeah, and sorry, my slides, for some reason, kind of blanked out. Uh, oh, is that, oh, wow. Well. Uh, so, let's move here. Yeah. Forward or backward? Yeah. Uh, so this is the. Uh, yeah, maybe I have to strip this back here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'll just use this. 
So um, um, adjuvant chemotherapy, because of the poor outcome, has become the standard um, in pancreatic cancer. Um, and this is now all in the NCCN guidelines and most guidelines as category one recommendation using combination regimen. So um, uh, as we discussed, aspect four, aspect four uh, gemcitabine and capcitabine versus gemcitabine. This was published a few years ago. And you can see that there's a survival benefit of 28 months versus 25.5 months. Um, and this has been popular in European countries. And then Prodigy 24, what the, um, this was uh, just much more recent, I think just earlier this year or, or late last year, um, using Mufoferinox versus gemcitabine, and much more impressive uh, results with the 54.4 months overall survival versus 35 months. So in fit patient, that has kind of become more of a standard. So, um, so now moving on to APAC trial. This was, um, um, the data was announced at the ASCO just uh, meeting just earlier this month. Um, and it was a randomized phase three trial uh, combining napalipaxel and gemcitabine, um, exactly how we use it in the Metasec setting for six cycles, or um, roughly six months, or single agent gemcitabine. Um, and, and, and this is kind of important to keep in mind right now. This is the first trial, and this is gonna be kind of a, the point of debate um, at when, when I present the data of this trial. It, this is the first adjuvant trial using independently assessed DFS rather than investigator assessed DFS. It's, it's basically using independent radiologists who just have the images, don't really have any other clinical data from the patient um, as a primary endpoint. Uh, so it's central review by radiologists, not involved in the trial, and then secondary endpoint, uh, overall survival and safety. So fairly typical for most of these trials. Um, as you can see, you probably can read all this, but baseline uh, characteristics are pretty evenly um, um, distributed across two arms, um, including lymph node status. And one thing to point out is most of these patients um, had R0 resection, about more than 70% had R0 resection. Most patients had lymph node positive disease. Um, and to, for this slide to highlight, it's really the dose intensity. Uh, as you can see, most patients as expected um, made it through the gemcitabine uh, for six months without um, much dose reduction. Um, versus in the uh, net palitaxel and gemcitabine arm, um, as you probably see in the metastatic setting too, we tend to dose reduce the, the net palitaxel much earlier, about 75% do, um, dose intensity and 80% gemcitabine. So this is not unexpected at all. Um, so here's the, the key slide. Um, so I, I have um, three Kaplan-Meier curves here. So this is the primary endpoint. Um, this is the in, independent review PFS. And then you have the investigator review of PF, uh, or DFS, and then um, the overall survival. You can see that in their primary endpoint, the two curves pretty much overlap. So based on their primary endpoint, this is a negative study. There, there is no difference. Um, and, but this was also the, the kind of the, the main thing that, um, that was debated at the ASCO meeting is was this really the right endpoint or did the did the study just simply pick the wrong um, primary endpoint to to you know they thought they were trying something new to go to use an independent review uh, PFS which was not the case in none of in all the other adjuvant trials in pancreatic cancer and when they went to the investigator assess DFS just like all the other trials then you can start seeing the curve separating I mean not by a whole lot but it, it, the p value was uh, significant. And, and then the overall, this is an interim overall survival, you can see that was, it was a positive study based on that, but that unfortunately that was a secondary endpoint. So, um, moving on in the subpopulation, the subgroup M analysis, you can see um, most of the, um, uh, uh, most of the subgroups that favor the NAP, Palifaxel, and gemcitabine arm, um, especially in ECOC-1, moderate differentiated, uh, lymph node positive, um, and also the, the normal CA199 cancer marker uh, groups. So not a big surprise there. And safety profile is also um, fairly kind of expected for, for those of you who have used um, palipaxel in the metasec setting. Um, more, more cytopenia and also a neuropathy, uh, peripheral neuropathy are kind of the main thing. Uh, so no big surprise there. So in conclusion, really the primary endpoint um, of independently assessed DFS was not met. So technically this was a negative trial, but, the over, but there was overall survival benefit. Um, 
and it would be interesting to see, that was an interim analysis, so it would be interesting to see if the final overall survival um, curve still separate, because then, it, then it, it's going to uh, generate more discussion about, well, sh should we still use this regimen? Um, and the, the, arg the, the argument for using um, independent review DFS, uh, as we have discussed, um, sometimes it's very difficult, and it, hurt, it happened early on in the trial that there were a lot of kind of questions from the independent radiologists review these um, um, scans that, well, are we looking at local recurrence or just post-surgical changes um, on the scan? And so that was kind of one of the sticking point on why maybe that, that could be the reason why independent review DFS didn't show any uh, benefit. And the other thing is, you know, a lot of times as clinicians, we can tell um, when, when you have a, a, a scan that shows kind of this mixed picture where is it disease progression or recurrence or is it just post-surgical changes? Um, and then we can say, well, the CA-199 is normal or the CA-199 is rising where the independent reviewer might not have that information. So, so that was kind of the other um, uh, a point of debate. So in conclusion, um, this is from Quoting uh, Margaret Tempera, who, who was the lead investigator in this trial, um, nap palliative on gemcitabine is, gemcitabine is a potential option for, potion, for patients who are not candidates for fulfirinox, despite it being a negative trial. But because of the overall survival benefit, um, at least based on interim analysis, the thought was it's reasonable to go ahead and use it. And it sounds like a lot of you already agree uh, on the question that we started out with. Um, and if you look at the uh, the survival data comparing all three trials, the ASPECT-4, APAC, and PRODIGY-24, um, you can see that the, pal the overall survival, um, both the palliative and gemcitabine and the porphyrinox um, regimen had much better um, overall survival than the gem cap arm um, in the ASPECT-4. Uh, however, I don't want you necessarily to be too obsessed with the numbers, and a lot of this has to do with the patient selection. Uh, for example, um, the APAC and Protege uh, 24 APAC had required all patients um, at the time of enrollment, their CA199 cancer marker had to be pretty much normal um, versus ASPEC 4 that it wasn't a sticking point. More, I think a lot of patients probably got on with R1 resection of residual disease. Um, um, and, and this, you know, you can kind of tell that based on the single gemcitabine arm, where in APAC and Prodigy 24, it's very similar survival in the single agent gemcitabine arm versus in SPEC 4, um, it was much lower, 25.5 months. So, so um, and the other um, um, uh, take, um, the other point of um, um, discussion is that in this era, um, most of us who treat a lot of pancreatic cancer are moving on um, toward using more neoadjuvant chemotherapy approach. So when more and more of these patients, including upfront resectable um, and, and borderline resectable, most, if, when most of these patients are being treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, do we still care about which one works better in the, in the adjuvant setting? Um, so, so I think this is an evolving field. Um, we actually more recently looked at the, um, the NSABP uh, database. Um, apparently, uh, in really in the world, um, very few people are, are we, we think that more and more of us are using new adjuvant chemotherapy but in the world, it's actually still less than 20%. Um, so, so I think the adjuvant chemotherapy is still relevant, but this is subject to change um, very soon. Um, and these are some of the ongoing trials um, looking at new adjuvant chemotherapy, including a SWOG trial, a NEONAX trial, and an Alliance trial. So um, moving on to the next trial, the POLO trial. Um, again, this is uh, made a New England Journal of uh, Medicine um, and also was on, presented at a plenary session at ASCO this year. Um, uh, we'll um, review some of the data. Uh, personally, I think this is only going to affect very small percentage of pancreatic cancer patients, um, but it's really a, a, a uh, the first biomarker-driven uh, randomized trial that was positive in pancreatic cancer. So this is for maintenance or lap uh, for germline BRCA mutated metastatic pancreatic cancer. So as mentioned, only about four to seven percent of um, uh, metastatic pancreatic cancer patients harbor germline BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation. Um, um, we have known that these patients probably benefit from platinum-based um, chemotherapy uh, for a while now. There are a couple of studies supporting that. Um, and uh, as you uh, know, metastatic cancer patients, um, right now really the two standard uh, combination regimen that we use are fulfirinox or gemcitabine and napalitaxel. 
um, and less than 50% of patients move, uh, go on to receive second line treatment. Um, Prior to this trial, no targeted treatment for, or, uh, for a biomarker select population um, in a phase three setting um, was ever um, done. And the rationale for PARP inhibition, um, uh, as you might know, um, Olaparib uh, traps PARP, in, um, the PARP enzymes, and then um, in normal cells, uh, there's the homologous recombination repair pathway uh, that, repair, that um, can um, um, allow the cells to survive. But um, in these BRCA mutated tumors, um, they don't have a, the, this HR pathway to um, repair the, the DNA damage, and usually that leads to cell death. So there are uh, earlier phase two elaborate trials in pancreatic cancer um, that they looked at. So in this uh, germline BRCA mutated patients, um, they did see a, a overall response rate of 21.7 percent. So there, there was you know good signal, and that's kind of what led to this phase three trial. Um, so the study design, um, patients were randomized to, uh, in a three to two ratio to a lap of an arm or placebo. And the patients, all these patients were metastatic pancreatic cancer patients um, and had confirmed uh, germline BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation. Um, and, and this is another um, point of discussion that we, we're gonna have later. So as long as they have received about four months of chemotherapy, and show, and show no evidence of disease progression, they are eligible to go on to this trial um, to be randomized. So BRCA mutation confirmed in germline, not, not just um, tumor, not, not just somatic, and um, at least four months of chemotherapy. They could have uh, more than four months of chemotherapy, um, but at least four months, so. Um, and as you can see, it's a very small percentage of patients, um, se about 7%. Um, and at the time of randomization, a lot of those patients, oh, sorry, at the time of screening, a lot of those patients turned out to be ineligible because they actually had disease progression too. So it's a very small number of patients. Um, um, and it's, it was actually pretty impressive. They were able to get 92 patients on a laparative arm and a 62 in a placebo arm. Um, one thing, uh, uh, again, they were pretty evenly distributed across two arms. Things to point out, uh, patients who, who got on this trial tend to be younger. So the median age usually for pancreatic cancer is in the 60s, about mid 60s. But here you have 57, probably because they have the germline BRCA mutation. Um, and then the other thing would be more uh, BRCA2 mutations were seen than BRCA1, more prevalent, 62% versus about 30%. Um, and uh, uh, most, of, most of these patients did receive first-line uh, platinum-based chemotherapy. Majority of them got fulfirinox. Um, you can see about um, uh, 86% um, in the left herb arm and 80% in the placebo arm got uh, fulfirinox. Uh, there are a couple of patients who got cisplatin gemcitabine, um, probably not as commonly done here, but still done. And, um, and it was actually a pretty impressive response rate of uh, a 50% response, complete or partial response in these patients, um, which is much better than just kind of your average pancreatic cancer in general. And that probably indicates the better response of these BRCA mutated patients to platinum based chemo. So um, primary endpoint was a PFS, um, and, it, and they also used independent central review. Um, but again, this is metastatic setting, so oftentimes there's less confusion uh, about saying adjuvant setting when you're trying to figure out post-surgical changes like, um, like uh, in the APAC trial. So um, fairly impressive uh, medium performance status. So, so me medium uh, pro progression-free survival uh, in a leopard arm, um, 7.4 months versus 3.8. So you can see the curve completely separate, almost double. Um, and the p-value was uh, significant. So this is kind of what got people excited. So it did show um, um, PFS uh, benefit. Um, and the PFS benefit um, was significant and, and was um, better across all subgroups um, too. And, uh, and, re, and there was better, uh, so as expected, there was, uh, there was better objective uh, uh, response in the olaparib group um, than the placebo group. But what's more impressive is um, this is probably rare to be seen in, meta, in metastatic pancreatic cancer patients. Um, two place, so two olaparib uh, arm patients have complete response. Um, so um, hard to do that with chemotherapy. But. But here's another um, thing. But on the other hand, 
um, in this study versus on, as opposed to the APAC trial, in this study, the interim analysis of overall survival, there's no difference, 18.9 versus 18.1. Um, and there were a lot of discussion about this too. So um, I think the key uh, is that a lot of patients in the placebo arm had, were able to cross over um, to the other arm. Um, or to go back on chemotherapy um, at time of progression. So that might explain why there's no overall survival difference. Um, most common side effects um, in Olaparib included uh, fatigue, nausea, diarrhea, um, but really the, the rest is fairly well tolerated. Um, so in conclusion, this was the first successful biomarker-driven trial in pancreatic cancer, um, and also the first successful maintenance trial in pancreatic cancer. Um, again, uh, there is significant PFS benefit, but no overall survival benefit, but was most likely due to the fact that there were crossover or going back on chemo. Um, so um, most of the placebo arm patient probably had other um, options once they progress. Um, and the other thing is, um, this is a little different than how uh, we are treating most of our pancreatic cancer patients. Most of us don't, for, for the responders, we don't really just stop at four months. We keep going with the chemotherapy. And so um, do we now tell those patients, especially the BRCA um, germline mutated patient, that we are going to put them on olaparib, or uh, what about just continuing chemotherapy? So I don't, I don't think we know the answer. But certainly, this is a reasonable strategy as a maintenance. Um, just as you know, you probably all know and see that fulfirinox is, is tough. Um, and really, um, it's, you can get patients up to six months, but a lot of time that requires a lot of dose reduction or interruption. And so, could this present as an um, alter, alternative strategy for, for maintenance? Um, I think it's a reasonable option to consider. Um, and more importantly, based on you know this trial, I think it was part of it, but. Now, the NCCN guidelines, it, it, uh, they do officially recommend that we should consider or we should recommend germline testing for every patient that comes in with pancreatic cancer. Um, this is going to be a, bur a big burden on the genetic counseling part. I know at our institution, um, there's, there's a way to even just get in there, and now they're recommending everyone to, to get tested. Um, I didn't put it here, but this for, for somatic mutation testing, um, NCCN guidelines does recommend um, considering that if you think someone can um, clinically benefit from that. So certainly someone who's frail and probably not even um, eligible to receive chemotherapy, doing somatic testing might, might not be beneficial. But they, they do recommend that we should start thinking about doing that for most patients. So uh, moving on um, to ability to track cancer, uh, bio -bio cancer. Um, here's another case. So 62-year-old uh, male with 10-pound weight loss and progressive jaundice over two months. Uh, again, excellent performance status. There's no significant comorbidities. Um, CT scan uh, done show, uh, revealed perihilar mass re involving the port vein portal vein and common hepatic artery. Patient was seen by a hepatobiary surgeon and thought this is unresectable due to extensive uh, vascular involvement. Um, there was also, um, oh, sorry. Um, there was also a, a periportal lymph node um, uh, involvement. So, Patient was started on cisplatin gemcitabine as first-line chemo. Um, this is kind of the current standard, but developed um, progression and liver metastasis after six cycles. So patient's still doing quite well. Performance status is still excellent. What would you consider a second-line chemotherapy? So A, full fox, um, B, uh, capcitabine, oxaliplatin, or K-pox, full fury, gemcitabine and capcitabine, capcitabine only, or uh, molecular driven therapy with a lot of some patients, you know, some, some of us are now sending foundation medicine or foundation one just to see if there's any targetable mutations. So here. Okay. So um, uh, looks like most of you are doing full Fox. Um, and may I just ask, is it because you guys had all seen the ABC 606 data already, or is this just kind of what you've been doing even before this came out? Well, that's, that's pretty good. Okay. So, um, moving on, again, I'm going to, sorry. I'm still not quite sure why my slide keeps on blanking out. Okay, we're back. 
So um, in um, Billy tract cancer um, included uh, gallbladder cancer, colon carcinoma, and um, in this trial, they actually in included ampullary cancer too, and this is certainly not the case in, in some of the other uh, Billy tract cancer trials. Um, so the prognosis, as you uh, probably know, is quite poor. Um, five years of over survival, less than 20%. Um, um, but there's definitely a lot of heterogeneity in, in these uh, group of cancer groups. It's lumping a lot of different cancer types into one. Um, and 80% were uh, diagnosed in advanced stages. So this has been around for a while now, and most of you probably um, are aware of this. ABC02 uh, trial done by the same group. Um, um, had uh, established cisplatin and gemcitabine as a current standard of care uh, for first-line chemotherapy. Um, overall, medium overall survival 11.7 months in cisgem arm um, versus 8.1 months in the gemcitabine arm. Um, so this has been standard probably since about 2010. Um, and, um, but up to this point, prior to the ABC06 trial, um, there have been other smaller studies for second line, but not really any uh, randomized uh, phase three for second line chemotherapy. Uh, until this one. Um, most of us, as you guys, just from that questionnaire, we, we just did um, five few of fluid permitting based chemotherapy has been um, kind of commonly used uh, in the second line setting. So the trial design, um, ABC06, um, there are two arms. Um, it's comparing full FOX um, versus just active symptom control. And I have to applaud the Europeans about uh, able to pull this off, because here in, in the U.S., I think it's very hard to convince patients with still excellent performance status that they are going to be able, they are just going to get active symptom control and, or um, only without chemo. Um, but, you know, they did it. Um, just a couple um, definitions. So um, in, in this trial, um, it's, so the inclusion criteria, they have to have a histologic confirmed uh, ability to track cancer. Um, ECOG performance status has to be zero to one uh, progression uh, after first line cisgem. Um, and they have to be randomized within six weeks after pro progression um, and have kind of standard um, adequate organ functions. So the other thing they were looking at, the one question that came up was most of these patients were, if they had to progress on, on cisplatin or platinum-based chemotherapy, does it make sense to use oxaliplatin in a second-line setting? So they, they looked at that issue and they defined uh, platinum sensitivity. So someone who's platinum um, sensitive means they progress after being off chemotherapy, off platinum-based chemotherapy for, for more than three months. Okay. And then, um, uh, It'll come on a little bit, but um, and then the refractory means they have progressed while they are on, they are still receiving chemotherapy, and then um, they use another term, so cisplatin resistant, and that means they have progressed within three months after coming off chemotherapy. Um, so uh, their primary endpoint overall survival, so fairly standard. Um, again, patient characteristics um, pretty equally distributed across both arms. Um, and again, they include empiric cancer, which is not necessarily included in some of the other trials. And, and here, the platinum sensitivity, so uh, about 58%, uh, so more than half uh, of majority patients were actually platinum resistant, so which means either they progress um, while they are still getting chemo, uh, cisgem, or they have progressed within three months. Um, and this is the uh, Kaplan-Meier curve for overall survival. So it did meet its endpoint. Um, there was an overall survival benefit. I can't say it's overly impressive. Uh, 6.2 months in the full Fox arm versus 5.3 in the um, uh, active uh, supportive care arm. Um, but the p-value was positive. Um, response rate is not, not all that impressive, only 5%, but the most patients did have 4 33% patient did have a disease control or stable disease. Um, Progression-free survival is about four months. And, uh, and as you can see, again, um, all subgroups appear to have benefited from um, the chemotherapy. Um, they're all on, on this side favoring chemotherapy. Um, can we see? And it's interesting here, let me point out. Oh, here. So 
uh, the platinum uh, sensitivity, it, as you can see, the, the one that were refractory or resistant actually had even more benefit. So, so this kind of answers the question of, you know, if they were already uh, progressing on first line platinum-based chemo, um, are they going to respond to oxide platinum-based chemo in the second line? And the answer seems to be yes. So um, in terms of adverse events, um, um, not, uh, again, pretty, pretty much expected. Um, pa patient who get full FOX versus um, just active support. Um, in the full FOX arm, there are more uh, fatigue, uh, cytopenia, uh, infection, um, basically all the typical um, side effects that you can see, you, you, you would expect from someone getting full FOX, not out of the norm here. Um, and most patients, um, when they progress on second line, um, um, did have the option of, of a third line treatment. Um, you can see that it's the number is an, it's actually quite low. Only about 14% of patients went on to third, uh, third line treatment. Um, some went on phase one clinical trials. Um, the placebo arm patient got, or the active support arm uh, patient got uh, full FOX. And then some of the full FOX patients um, went on to uh, other type of therapy. Um, so it looks like it's over the map. Gemcitabine, gem, uh, gemcitabine carpal uh, platin. Or, I, I was surprised that you know, not more people got uh, full theory. So, so in conclusion, um, survival and active con symptom control arm of more than, better than five months, um, that was actually pretty impressive for, for these patients who tend to have a fairly aggressive course and got pretty much no chemo, no, no treatment, and still survived um, more than five months. So that, that was actually better than um, what the investigator had ex expected. Um, but since we don't have any other randomized phase three trial, this is the first one. Um, based on this data, I would advocate that Fofox should become the standard of care and second line um, treatment of Billy tract cancer. Um, um, however, I'm gonna show you a couple of slides. Really molecular, molecular targeted options and um, clinical trials should be encouraged when, uh, when um, patients have access to them. Um, this, this is really a push and really, um, if anything, for second line um, red treatment options, um, I suspect for a subgroup of patients, this will actually become an option uh, over full FOX. Um, and then for, for the ABC06 trial, the quality of life, health economy evaluation, translation research are ongoing. So in terms of targeted therapy for Billy tract cancer, um, I'll share with you the slides. So up for about 30% of Billy tract cancer um, actually could have a potentially targetable mutations, uh, including BRAF, um, BRAF mutation, KRAS, uh, PI3 kinase, um, and just to highlight a couple that are kind of really making um, um, a lot of advancement uh, over the last few years. The FGFR2 fusion mutation, which is seen about 10 to 15 percent um, of the intrahepatic cholangeal carcinoma patients, and the IDH1 um, and 2 substitution, also in a fairly high number um, in the intrahepatic cholangeal carcinoma patients. Um, these two have probably m made most, of, most progress up to this point. Uh, there are multiple trials, and right now there are probably about six companies developing FGFR2 uh, inhibitor or FGR inhibitor in general, and most of them have reported pretty, um, um, a pretty good, pretty impressive response rate. Um, 40%, I think there were a couple that's even up to 50%. Um, and IDH1, uh, similar. In fact, uh, um, I think there was a news announcement for the IDH1 um, inhibitor uh, for this population that was uh, also positive. So I, I think um, if you're, right now we stand, we routinely recommend most of our um, uh, bowel duct cancer patient to undergo a, a molecular screening. We, we also use foundation medicine. I know some of you come from larger institutions, might have your institutional thing. But re the, I think it's important to test all these patients for uh, mutations um, to, uh, because it might give them more options other than just chemotherapy. Um, the M MSI high patients, um, this is fairly standard, about 3%. You know, again, this is someone that you can use that immunotherapy on. Um, so uh, there's a, a proposed cooperative group trial, the umbrella side called BATCH trial. Um, this is kind of going on the, the MATCH trial. So the thought is that while they are receiving first-line platinum-based chemotherapy, like CISGEM, to go ahead and start molecular profile of their tumor. Um, and then if they have any targetable mutations, really once they progress on the first line treatment, is to then um, match them to the appropriate trial. And th there's ongoing discussion. This is a trial being proposed by the uh, International um, Cholangeal Carcinoma Research Network. 
um, and so I think that this is getting a lot of excitement. So this could become a, a, um, a good alternative in terms of second line treatment um, as opposed to just full box. So um, moving on to the final topic, locally advanced uh, GEJ um, or G junction adenocarcinoma. Um, really the, the question of neoadjuvant chemo radiation versus perioptic chemotherapy in this particular group has generated a lot of um, discussion and debate. And we encounter this issue in tumor boards all the time. It's like, should we give this patient radiation or should we do chemotherapy? Um, so um, here again to present a case, 70 year old otherwise healthy male with 15 pound weight loss, progressive dysphagia over three months, uh, excellent performance status. Uh, under one EGD in US, um, found an ulcerate lesion at 39 centimeter. It was a sewer type two, so a true G junction cancer. Uh, US staging was T3N1, and PET CT didn't really show any dysmetastatic disease. So, what would you do next? Um, um, again, new adjuvant chemo radiation with uh, carbotaxel, just like in the cross trial. Perioptic chemotherapy using FLOT. Um, or perioptic chemotherapy using um, ECF, ECX, which was based on the magic approach. Um, what about just full fox only without the, the anthracycline, without the epirubicin, which is not uncommonly done too? Or do you think this patient should proceed with a surgical resection? So. Okay, well, we'll, we'll get through this very quickly. Okay, so um, most of you are picking flawed. I'm guessing there is no radiation oncologist in this room? So um, well, I'll make some quick um, um, arguments for each, and then we can, I, I should be able to go through it in a few minutes. So, um, so the current NCCN guideline uh, for, so every time I did a question, uh, it kind of just disappeared. Yeah. So, um, so the current NCCN guideline does recommend either, either, either approach for these local events, G junction and adenocarcinoma. Um, so chemoradiation, preoptic chemoradiation, or perioptic chemotherapy are both considered um, 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 standard um, and really is kind of dealer's choice. It doesn't tell you which one's better. So hopefully after this uh, the few, next few slides um, will maybe help you make the, a better choice. So uh, traditional GE junction cancer, um, is also kind of lumped into trials for esophageal cancer um, that included most of the esophageal, and, and then there's overlap. A lot of gastric cancer trial also include G-junction cancer. That's why it's all often in the middle, kind of in the no man's land, like you know which one is better because they're included in both type of trials. So the cross trial um, in, presented in 2012 and uh, was updated uh, in 2015, just really randomized patients with um, esophageal cancer and included G-junction um, to either uh, straight of surgery or uh, neoadjuvant chemo radiation to carpal uh, taxol. Um, you see, uh, it's kind of hard to see here, but um, most of, so, so there's most of the patients, uh, more than 70% of patients were either in the distal esophagus, um, probably extending G junction or true G junction cancer. Uh, just to highlight that. And then the, the FLOT trial, um, using a very aggressive regimen. This is a German trial using docetaxel, oxaliplatin, and a a five fluor or so. Um, this was presented uh, a couple years uh, last year. Um, again, showing this was comparing with the magic regimen of using ECF slash ECX uh, type of uh, regimen, um, and it um, showed that here the the flat was better than the magic uh, regimen. So. Um, with a hazard ratio of 0 0.76, um, impressive, uh, fairly impressive overall survival of 15 months, and five year survival of 45%. Um, as a, just a refresher, the MAGIC trial showed that it was in about 36% five year uh, overall survival. Um, and the CROSS trial, uh, medium overall survival of 43.2%, but when this was updated in 2015, it went up to 48.6. So really, for between FLOT and CROSS, the overall survival um, it's fairly similar, about, about 15 months. And, and this is to highlight that um, in both trials, the FLOT is really a gastric cancer slash G junction trial versus the CROSS is an esophageal cancer slash uh, G junction cancer trial. But if you look at the total number of patients, um, um, they were actually, um, 
198 patients um, in, in the FLOT trial versus 134. There are actually more GE junction cancer patients in the FLOT trial. Um, and, and you separate out the GE junction patients, the hazard ratio um, held, and it was actually even a little better than the, the gastric cancer. And here, um, looking at RGL resection rate between the two types, the FLOT versus CROSS, um, pretty impressive RGL resection rate in the FLOT about 85% and in cross, 82%. So very similar, and this is as compared to the magic type of trial, ECX, only in the 60% in the range. So really the arterial resection rate flat is about the same as cross and both are better than magic. So, and what about a pathologic response? Um, I've, so in, in FLOT, the overall group, about 16% of pathologic complete um, response. Um, but if you look at the intestinal subtype, which tends to be the G junction cancer, the diffuse type are more mostly just in the gastric, um, about 23% in the G junction type of cancer, intestinal subtype, and 23% in cross. So, so the pathologic response rate um, uh, is very similar. And, and that's one of the arguments um, we, we often hear that for, with a perioptic chemotherapy, you don't see as good a pathologic response rate, and with radiation, you can improve that. But you can see that it's actually pretty similar. Um, local recurrence rate. One argument I hear from the radiation oncologists is that uh, with radiation, you can uh, improve, it's, you get better local disease control and local recurrence. But you can see that um, uh, most patients that have recurrent either trials were actually distant recurrence, 88% in the flood, 90% in the cross. But local recurrence um, was 18.5% in FLOT versus 22% in CROSS. So, um, so again, the argument doesn't really hold that radiation um, is better than chemo only in uh, decreasing uh, local recurrence. Um, I think this is the, the probably the best argument um, to pick chemo radiation over perioperative chemotherapy is the toxicity. Um, as you can see, chemo radiation is actually quite well tolerated. Most of the, so there's not really a lot of grade three toxicity or higher, it's all like 5% or less, versus in FLOT, um, definitely a lot more diarrhea, a lot more um, kind of cytopenia. Okay, so a couple more slides. <laughs> Um, and here's the other thing, financial toxicity. And this, you don't see this in any of the, the um, journals I did, you read about uh, this. But FLOT, with just two months or four cycles of FLOT before um, surgery and after surgery versus chemo radiation, you're, ta you're talking about, and this is in the US, $47,000 for FLOT. And even if you throw in the new last support, the PEC, um, Philcris, the GCSF support, it's about $147,000. With CROSS, with the radiation, you're talking $188,000 per patient. Um, and if they oftentimes have to do a boost to radiation, you're talking about $300,000. So there's a huge um, cost difference between the chemo only versus um, um, the chemo radiation arm. So in conclusion, uh, FLOT versus CROSS, really there's similar R0 resection rate, similar pathologic response rate, R0 local recurrence rates are all similar. Um, and I, it says even though the flood technically has a slightly overall, overall uh, slightly overall survival, slightly better overall survival rate, but it's really similar. Um, flood is less expensive and, and more convenient. It does not require a patient to come in every day for radiation for five to six weeks. Really, it's just you know four sessions before surgery and four sessions after. Um, but it is more toxic. It's definitely not for everyone. Um, in flood. Uh, so I think I went through one of the slides really quickly. Uh, in, in CROSS, like about 95% of patients uh, were able to complete the whole chemo radiation um, before surgery. Versus in FLOT, 90% um, of patients were able to complete the neoadjuvant portion, but less than 50% were able to complete the adjuvant portion after surgery. So that's definitely one, um, one argument against FLOT. It's, uh, it's tough for people to, to, have to be able to receive two more months of chemo afterward. Um, however, in fit patients, I do think it's a reasonable alternative to cross, um, especially for patients who you know have a hard time coming in every day for six weeks to to get radiation, um, and where they are fit enough and chemotherapy or, or uh, um, they're able to tolerate that side effect. I do think considering FLOT is a reasonable option. Um, eventually, this this question of FLOT versus a chemo radiation um, will be answered. It's, there's ongoing trial looking at this exact issue, it randomized patient to FLOT or chemo radiation. 
and, um, and hopefully we'll have the result in a few years. So that's all. Thank you. We have about two minutes, so it's, it's going to be truly rapid fire. And let's see if I can get to the questions. I probably won't editorialize much on the, um, the answer. So, it, and, and, and as you see, there's different ways of asking. There's, there's sort of the, you know, the board's way of asking, and you, um, there's an absolute right answer, or at least a seemingly right answer. And then there's a way I ask questions, which is like, yeah, kind of, <laughs> there's kind of a right answer. Um, so let's just go ahead. This, this is a 55-year-old gentleman with uh, a, a, a gastric adenocarcinoma, uh, and it's metastatic to liver and serosa. He's HER2, uh, EBF-ish, and PL1, they're sent, and he started on full fox. HER2 is equivocal by IHC and FISH. PDL1, the, the combined positive score is 11 to 20. So this was data that was, pub that, that was just presented at, at, at ASCO. Has everybody figured out how to go SCH, I think it's SCHD18, so you, you plug in 22333. Everyone get your phones out. I'm just kidding. So um, metastatic gastric equivocal HER2 started on full fox. I, I actually was called this last week by one of my uh, former colleagues, and he said, what do we do? Do you add Herceptin, that's A. Do you switch to FLOT with anticipation of surgery if excellent response? So do you ever take a, a metastatic gastric to surgery? Uh, continue full fox and assess response, someone's answered. Stop full fox and initiate Pembro, or add Pembro to full fox? Looks like one person, has, or everybody agrees. Okay. I think you're right. I, I actually, you know, I t try to be a little bit of a purist and, uh, and basically said to stop full fox and initiate Pembro was one thing that was brought up at ASCO, and you're right, the, the, the slides blank out. So if you look here, it, there, the, this was, a, this was a, a three arm study. It looked at Pembro and chemo, chemo and Pembro alone. And if you looked at the uh, basically overall survival, it was almost a year and a half in Pembro alone. With chemo, it was it was it was 10.8 months. With Pembro and chemo, it was about a year. So those were similar. So the the question is, should we be using Pembro alone up front? And I don't know if the chemo is attenuating the the, the response to immunotherapy, which we haven't really we don't see that in breast cancer because chemo immunotherapy is is front line. We don't see that in lung cancer, both small cell and non-small cell. So I, I thought this was interesting data, and um, we'll move along. A 52-year-old woman presents with six months of hematochesia. Basically, she has a stage 3B, uh, PT3N1B, uh, stage 3 colon cancer. She's ECOG0, excellent health, no significant comorbidities. The following three-month adjuvant regimen has best data su to support its use. So three months of K-POX plus a TESO, three months of full FOX, three months of K-POX, exactly, or three months of capecitabine alone. So the IDEA trial did not look at capecitabine alone, and you're right. Th this was uh, three months of K-POX certainly has the best data, um, even probably in the high-risk stage threes, and also, as we saw, in the high-risk stage twos. 55-year-old man with metastatic gastric cancer to liver and cirrhosis, so similar, has a large DVT. He comes in, he sees you, he's got a swollen leg. Um, now, read the question carefully. Which is the safest anticoagulation to give according to two recent? So there was a, the Hokusai trial and then the SELECT-D trial. Rivaroxaban, Edoxaban, Warfarin, or Daltaparin? Yeah, it, it, it was Daltaparin. So I, 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 <laughs> I think this is interesting because, I, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about what are the new drugs and what are the new trials that we're doing and are, how are we moving the needle a little bit forward with progression-free survival. But supportive care is extraordinarily important. And I think the interesting thing, the Hokusai trial and the SELECT-D trial, at least at our center, DOACs are the standard anticoagulation across almost all cancer patients, at least solid tumor patients. Um, but if you look at it, if you look at the... Uh, 
Yeah, here we go. So, so this was in the supplemental data for both the New England Journal of Medicine, this was Hokusai, and the Select D. G, the GI cancers, this was a yes. Uh, this favored more toxicity with the DOAC. So these were more, to the DOACs were more toxic in GI cancers. The, the New England Journal of Medicine, they didn't separate out if it was upper or lower or what the GI tumor was, but the uh, Select D did, and essentially, if you had an upper GI cancer, you were much more likely to have a major bleed. So I, I, I don't know if this change, I, I really don't know if this changes the standard that we should be using for metastatic upper GI. I don't know if we should be using low molecular weight heparin, Lovenox at our center, but I want you guys to be aware. Um, the last one, actually, uh, this is the fourth one. So um, this, is, this is a 68-year-old who comes and sees you after already having his pancreatic tumor removed, his stage three pancreatic tumor removed. He's an ECOG-2, hasn't recovered well, and seeing you for adjuvant therapy. What's the right answer? Fulfirinox, which is what I would do. Just kidding, I, I would not do that. Gem capecitabine for six months, gem abraxane, or no adjuvant therapy. And this really doesn't have a right answer. I, I actually agree probably with the, with the gemcitabine, capecitabine, um, or gemcitabine alone, or nothing. Again, ECOG-2. Here's the last one. A 50-year-old gentleman with low-lying rectal cancer. I didn't cover this in my talk. So this is low-lying, two centimeters from the anal verge. It's a T4 with four suspicious appearing lymph nodes, clinical N2 disease which is the least appropriate therapy. So long course, chemo radiation with Zolota, followed by surgery, followed by Folfox. This is sort of the standard. Folfox for two to three months, then reassess. Short course, followed by surgery, or this is the total neo neoadjuvant therapy, which I didn't go over, but total neoadjuvant therapy, I think is coming down the pike. And, and I, think, I think both of those are correct. So I will leave it at that. Thank you guys so much. And, uh, Again, thank you for having both of us.